Sound Talk Radio. It's Cannon Baby coming with the heat. Got Indy Fire playing in my speakers. The kid of the host, girl in motion. All the way near, airway smoking. You can call in this phone lines open. Rock is hot like we're cooking the road. Indy Fire the goat. Don't ask who the competition is. Cause they're standing alone. Pop it. When you listen to here, you always hear what you interview. Artists, songwriters, authors, and entrepreneurs. Chopping it up with powerful icons who make her influence. Who keep it hotter? This is Indy Fire. Blazing on yourself. Tune in and catch the heat. It don't even matter where you at. Entertainment, news, and daily inspiration for everyone. Yeah. Holy moly, this day heat. Got Nakia in my feet. Girl in motion, get on your feet. Indy Fire, blazing, please. Keep it coming every week. We too strong, we defeat the week. Can and baby, super speed, we keep it turning to the T. It's too high. A fireman can't put it out, cause it's too high. In the fire, it's too high. A fireman can't put it out, cause it's too high. In the fire, yeah. Entertainment, news, and daily inspiration for everyone. For everyone. Entertainment, news, and daily inspiration for everyone. Everyone, entertainment, news, and daily inspiration for everyone. For everyone, entertainment, news, and daily inspiration for everyone. For everyone, for everyone, yeah. What's good? What's good? What's good, guys? It's Monday. Welcome to another episode of Indie Fire with your girl, Nakia. How was your weekend? Mine was amazing. And I know you're wondering, like, what did you do that made it so amazing? I, 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 just, I just rested. I told you I was going to, you know, like, just do some self-care and just sit back and, and relax. And, and that's what I did, like, to the point where I really don't remember, like, everything I, I really did because... I just sat back and and relaxed, but it was amazing because I do not get the opportunity just to sit back and and relax so much so that today, you know, normally Mondays are just, you know, my Mondays are just, it takes all day for Mondays to just go by and I didn't go to work today. I didn't. My daughter is on fall break and we had intentions of going to some place today where they did something really amazing that no other place in the state does and we kind of overslept so we went someplace else and we did something that other place I I can't drop too much information but we just had a really amazing day in the midst of me doing you know working you know I had like all my devices so I was still working but I wasn't really working you know and I I told my boss this morning I was like hey I'm not coming in and and she was like I'm sorry, is there something wrong? And I said, I'm just not coming in. And she just expected like this long, you know, um, well, I'm going through this. And no, I don't really owe you an explanation. I'm just not coming in today. I'm going to take a mental health day. And she was like, oh, you deserve that. Like, I don't think, I don't, I'm gonna, I don't recall you taking days off. Like, you know, even after your surgery, like you were working. So, yeah, you deserve that. But, you know, I'm also going to be traveling the next two days, <laughs> so I won't be at work either, you know. So, yeah, just really good to just sit back and just just do things with my younger two kids and just let them know that I'm I'm present in their lives. And half the things that they talk about, I, I don't have a clue. You know, the music that they listen to, that J-pop and that K-pop and that you know, I don't have a clue what they're saying. You know, I don't speak the language, but I nod my head. And I was in the presence of a lot of uh, Asians today, and I just nodded my head, you know, ate the food and enjoyed it. You know what I'm saying? But now I don't know what's going on. Um, but just to be present in their lives today, it just and, – and even though I was working sidelines, you know, still to be present in their lives, they really enjoyed that today. So, um, and the mental, you know, we talk about that every Monday, you know, how you have to um, speak that, those positive affirmations and just change your 
thinking, thinking, you know, and make sure that your 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 mental is in the right space, you know. Um, just just being there made a big difference in their lives today. So um, I recommend it. Uh, but let me let me let's talk less about myself and find out what you guys did this weekend. Somebody shoot me that quick text message so I can shout you out really quickly and let me know how your weekend went. You know what you do? Is it fair in your your state? Uh, is it fair in your city? Did you go to your state fair? I know state fairs are popping up everywhere. You know, but well, what did you do? Um, go see a new movie. Just let me know really quickly so I can shout you out. All right. Um, so no shows tomorrow because of course I'll be traveling. But we will be back on Thursday, 6:30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with blues singer and songwriter, producer and rapper. Black Coffee, again, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then on next week, where's my calendar when I need it? (laughs) On the 17th, yes, Monday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, DJ Teddy Bear, the Southern Soul Dance DJ, DJ Teddy Bear is going to be here with me at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then on Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Bronx rap spoken word artist Vega is going to join us here on Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then on Thursday, artist and photographer Dion Renee. Remember we talked about her briefly? One of three artists selected to artists. When I say artists, I mean like um, as in painter type photographer yes that type uh one of three to be selected from the u.s to have their um art work displayed in the woman team so i'm super excited to have her here on next thursday the 20th at 6 30 p.m eastern standard time new music monday returns on next monday at 8 p.m eastern standard time as well so if you cannot make them all please 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 do not miss them all. All right? Super excited to have my guest here with me this evening. Some of you um, shot me a quick message, and you were like, the name sounds familiar. And you probably do remember the name. Um, he was here with us back in, I want to say it was 2018, because he was our 2019, our very first best male author recipient. Um, none other than uh, best-selling, award-winning author, uh, Gerald C. Anderson, Sr. He was born and raised in Tampa, Florida. He spent most of his childhood life growing up in the Belmont Heights area of Tampa. In 1980, Gerald graduated from the Leon King Senior High School in Simple Terrace, Florida. Following graduation, he enlisted in the United States Air Force. In his service career, Gerald traveled the world with assignments to California twice, Florida, Kansas, Maryland, West Germany, and Korea. Upon his last assignment in Maryland and after retirement from the Air Force, Gerald began working in the United States Federal Government's Department of Energy. In 2003, he moved to the Internal Revenue Service, and in 2007, he joined the Department of Education. In 2005, Gerald got his Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Information Systems from Strayer University. And in 2008, he received his Master of Administration degree in Criminal Justice Administration from the University of Cincinnati, UC. His published book, I Did Count 19, (laughs) I'm not going through all of these titles, but I do know that his latest book, A Fatal Misperceptions, which we will speak of in depth tonight, was just released October the 4th. A saved man. In 1992, Gerald turned his life over to Jesus Christ and a life of Christ at the head. He is a musician in church, and he continues to live in Maryland with his son. In the fire listening audience, I present to you this evening my very special guest, best-selling, award-winning author, editor, producer, and musician, Gerald C. Anderson, Sr.
How are you this evening? Hey, I'm doing good. Glad to be back again. So I'm glad some people started to recognize my name, too. <laughs> yes, yes. Welcome back. Welcome back. I don't get to say that, too, but welcome back. So glad to have you here with me this evening. And you know what? I actually forgot you were like our first um, best male author winner. I think I was scrolling through doing my stalking as as usual, uh, scrolling through your Instagram, and I saw um, the award, and I was like, oh, he was. He did win. That's right. So, yes, yeah, yes because I was yeah, actually I trying to find when you were here without having to go through over 350 episodes trying to find when you were here last. So, um, yes, 2018 is when he was here last, and our 2019 Best Male um, Author. So, yes, and so much has transpired because when I saw the the your published books, I believe Warlord is what I remember, right. the last book. Was Warlord. Oh, yeah. All of these other yeah, titles, we, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we went on from there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we went on from there. <laughs> yeah. So okay. I want to just uh, briefly just, tell, you know, talk about your life as an author really quickly because I want to spend an in-depth amount of time talking about your latest book, um, Fatal Misperceptions, and um, why domestic violence um, is so important to you. Right here in October, when I when I received um, the message, you, you were speaking to my assistant, um, you know, going back and forth about setting this interview up. And um, she says, you know, I believe I remember him, you know, being on the show earlier, but he has, you know, this domestic violence campaign and um, he's trying to get on the show, you know, the month of October. And I, I told him, you know, um, that you were, you know, a DV advocate, and I, I feel like it's very important that he gets on the show in October. And I said, you know, yes, you know, if, if anybody gets on the show in October, he needs to be the one to get on the show in October, you know, for very specific reasons. So I, I do want to give, for those who do not know who Gerald is, um, let's talk about your career as an author first, but then I want to, you know, go in depth on this new book, and, and talk about why it is so important, um, this book, and then your domestic violence um, campaign. If that's all right with you. That sounds great to me. So, all right. Uh, my, my, my writing career actually began in, um, with my first published book in 2010. But after I graduated, and you read my bio, after I graduated from the uh, University of Cincinnati in 2008, I uh, spent a lot of time writing in that master's degree program, so it was a lot of academic writing going on. And so after I was done, I was like, whew, finally finished. <laughs> got, got my degree, but then I said, you know what, I want to do some writing that's that's going to be fun. I want to tell some stories that I had pent up in my mind on my computer. And, and so that's how the, um, the, the writing career started. You know, I talked to some people about uh, how are we going to get this done and you know, how do I how do I even write? You know, how do I even get started writing? And so it took me two years to write my first book, and that was called We Come in Peace, and that's that's where my career began. And and I didn't didn't want it to end there because I had so many stories in my head, and I, and I and then I get stories like sometime in the middle of the night, and I get up and I write them out on my phone, or I voice them into my phone, or somehow so I don't forget them. And so um, you know, you read you, you said nineteen is actually about twenty three now. Uh, since that since that bio needs to be updated, uh, so I have those all published, but I have probably another good ten on my computer just waiting to be written, uh, just uh, synopsis of stories that I've dreamed about or came uh, just thought about and came up with, and so I, and I tell writers all the time if you if you want to be in this business and especially fiction writers, you need to have some kind of way of capturing your thoughts no matter where you are, because you never know where inspiration is going to come up at. So when that inspiration right. comes, you want to be able to write it down or, or take it down some kind of way. So my phone's always on, my, my phone's always on me, so I always have a way of capturing that, that, that inspiration so I can come back to it later. Now, in the midst of me snooping somewhere, I came across uh, an article. Maybe, maybe it was a blog. 
post that you did um, for people like me who have all of these stories in their head and they yet to come out. You did a blog about short stories. Uh, and I thought, oh, you know what? That would be perfect for someone who has all of these stories and they yet to come out, but you don't even know where to start. And that's my problem. I want to write, but I don't even know where to start. Um, expand upon that just a little bit, how short stories work and, and where a person, you know, like me could, you know, uh, get their short stories published. Well, I, I love short stories because uh, you, you tell the story quicker. And, and, and in this microwave era, I think people like shorter stories. So I think they like short stories. They like um, what what's called novellas, which is about 30,000 words or less. So I, I, they like quicker things. They like to be able to get through the book quicker. So, and you publish, you can publish short stories just like you publish a regular book. Um, Amazon has a category, in fact, for short short reads, you know, less than an hour or less than three hours. And there's a category for that as well. Because I have about seven of my, of my 23 are short stories that are published on, on um, Amazon. And I just released back in July a public, a, um, a compilation of short stories, it was 19 short stories in, in one book called Creative Inspiration. Because I had all these short stories in, uh, on my computer, and so I found it, went through them all, and I put them all together in one book and released that one book. And so short stories are great, especially if, if you want to get started writing and, and, and you know you want to write this 100,000-word novel at some point, you can you can crone, uh, hone your your uh, craft by using short stories, you know. And short stories can be, you know, ten thousand words, and, and, and you can get it out and, and get it out to the public, publish it just like you would any other book, you know, and get it out there. I love them. I, I love them because because you publish them, put them out there, sell them, you know, for whatever price you deem is necessary, and it helps you it helps you get started with the writing process because. I I see the writing process just like you exercise. You, you know, do homework. You know, you get you get used to doing homework at six o'clock every day for an hour. So if if you become a writer, you get to get used to doing your writing at six o'clock every day for an hour. You know, or whatever time you choose, and you you just train your body to do that every day. And and I think once you once you train your body to do that, then you go on and on with it, and you find yourself writing books. Like it, like I said, it started two years for me. My first book was two years. Now I can get a book done in one to two months. So. Wow. Now, Creative Inspirations, uh, you just mentioned, um, is a collection of short stories that has a little bit of Christian fiction, romance, science fiction, uh, police drama, and supernatural. I read the first one and um, was so mad when I got to the end. See, that's what I don't like about short stories because it leaves at the end. You're like, wait a minute, no, like you need more. Like, where's the next part? You know, but then you're going on to the next story then, and I, I put it down because I was mad because there's no more. You know, I, yeah. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's what they're designed for. It's to, it's to tell a story. <laughs> if you think of a 30 minute. Uh, show on TV, that's, that's equivalent to right, well, a, right. a short story. And sometimes, you know, you watch a TV, a TV show, and it's 30 minutes long, and you got so into it, and you're like, yeah, 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 and then the next thing you know, it's off. <laughs> you're right. like, where's the rest of it? <laughs> yeah. But that's, the short stories are, are designed to be the same way. So. <laughs> now, when it comes to um, the books that you write, do you try to be more original or do you deliver to the readers what they want? So say, all right, I know that with Fatal Misperceptions, um, this book was released uh, for the month of October, October for a specific purpose. But say the next book that you put out, you read the reviews, um, and you hear what your listening audience or your reading audience says. Now, the next book that you put out, um, is it by demand, or are you – um, just writing off the dome. Are you writing what you know, what you feel? How do you write? Yeah, I, I write what I feel. I, I um, 
my like I, I mentioned about inspiration and getting that inspiration. Uh, what it, whatever my inspiration is at, at a certain time, that's what gets me going. Like, um, but for for standing firm, which was 2015 domestic violence uh, uh, novel, and this novel, Fatal Misperception, those are the only two novels that really I did for a purpose. You know, to give standing firm aware. I'm not standing firm, but domestic violence awareness out. Uh, so those two were designed, those two were the only two that were designed for his purpose. The rest of them were, were whatever I was feeling at that moment, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the inspiration comes from. So it's, it's, it's funny that you, that you mentioned that because most of the time, like with Fatal Misperceptions coming out, actually Fatal Misperceptions was done a year ago, August, but because I had the death nights out, I didn't want it to, to collide together. So I, I held off on fatal misperceptions for a year, put it out now. So in that time, of course, I've released other books, and now I still have like two books that are completed that just need to be released. So I've already written the books. So, so, but if people come back and 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 say something to me about about what they want to see or what they want to read, then I then I'll, I'll look into it and see if I get any inspiration from that point. But my writing is mostly by inspiration. You know what I'm what I'm inspired inspired by. For you, can you remember um, the time? And I know that you you talked about um, in your master's program all of the writing that you had to do. Um, but can you think back earlier than that? Maybe maybe as a child when you realized that language had power? Hmm. Um, I can't honestly say that, that I had that thought and realized it, but later on in life I can look back and, and see where I, I realized that, that words have power. And I did, I did realize that later in life, not, not back when I, was, uh, when I was young. But that, the first story I ever wrote, I actually had that idea for probably about 20 years in my head. You know, and, and, and then I, once I finished that, that course, that, that program, I started writing it. But um, it's, it's really only in the last, since I started writing, becoming a writer, that's when I realized just really how powerful words are. You know, whether, whether it's one of our magazine articles that moves somebody, but I've had people come up to me since, since Standing Firm. And, you know, I had, had so many people come up to me after Standing Firm or doing the Standing Firm tour that talked about, them being a survivor of domestic violence, and I was looking at them like, "You look so strong. I would have never thought that you, you know, went through this. But you just never know who has has gone through this situation. And so, and so that is the inspiration for freedom and perception because you have people that you know you see them today and they're strong, but that but they not they haven't always been that way. You know, they they come through something. So that's the, the main character right. in Fatal Misperception is going to go through something, but, you know, later on in life, you know, she becomes a stronger person. So, you know, that was the inspiration for, for Fatal Misperception is that so many people I met, you know, during the Standing Firm tour, and they and they confided in me. And they, I had people call me, text me, you know, email me, telling me their story, you know. I had, you know, message me on my, on my author page telling me their story. I even had one guy tell me his story about being abused. So that was really interesting too. So, you know, all of, all of that um, kind of inspired me to, to you know, say, hey, I, I got to do another one of these books. And that's where we come with Fatal Misperception. All right. So since we're here and you continue to throw out Fatal Misperceptions, <laughs> let's get into um, uh, Fatal Misperceptions. Um this is your newest release, uh, October the fourth. So it is it's, it's brand new. Um, let's talk about the book just a little bit and why domestic violence is so important to you. Let's let's start there. Why is domestic violence so important to you? To so those who have just... missed the show back in 2018, why is this? Because there are so many causes. Um, and this is something that I ask a lot of my artists, you know, what what does your brand do in the community? 
Um, and, you know, a lot of them support homelessness awareness. Um, they might support uh, breast cancer awareness during this month, um, back-to-school fundraisers, you know, drives. Um, but there aren't a lot of brands that actually get out there and support uh, rape crisis. Um, they don't support domestic violence awareness. You know, they don't support human trafficking awareness. And those are three that I do support. Um, but why is it so important to you? Let's start there. When I was eight years old, I was living in Bama Heights. Um, so I was I was standing at my door, and there was an argument going on outside. Um, my neighbors, it was a husband and wife, and and I, I this store, this image just always stuck in my head for all those years, you know, because it, it just imprinted on me. And so this man, he hit this woman, and she fell to the ground. You know, and then people, you know, were coming out and they were saying stuff and saying they were going to call the police. And of course, he ran away and everything. But that that image imprinted, and I can see it clearly today. It just imprinted on my mind, and, I, and I, it just I was just so sad that to see that happen. You know, and, and and part that was my number one motivation right there for that saying I would never hit a woman. I would never be that guy. You know, so and and the thing goes on where the police catch him and. They want to put charges on this up, but she doesn't want to put charges on them. And the guy's back in the, in the apartment the next day or two, you know. So that that is why that's really what got the ball rolling with, with domestic violence with me because that's always been in my mind. And then I had friends and uh, that, that had gone through it, and family had gone through it. And before even before Sandy Fern came out, you know, would mention it here and there. You know, they weren't they weren't actually confiding in me because they didn't know it was my uh, mission and wanting to make to bring awareness to this, but um, so that was really the motivation right there. It all started with that incident right in front of my eyes that I saw, you know. So that's why it all started out in, in, in 2015 when Sandy Fern came out. You know, it was just this outpouring of people that was just, you know, wanting to tell their story. I got to go to a, a, a women's shelter. To, to see women who had survived the situation, they were in a shelter and they were trying to get their lives together, and they were so thankful to see a man taking up this mantle and, and trying to bring awareness to more people. And that was another thing that really impacted me, seeing them ladies there, and so they're showing their appreciation for me being there, and they don't know I appreciate them for confiding in me and telling me their stories and stuff, you know, and. and so I gave them all books, and I brought them all to the book launch, and we fed them, and they had a really good time. So I, I felt really good about that. So that's what got me started with domestic violence. And I just want to throw in that intimate partner violence accounts for um, 15% of all violent crimes annually in the United States. Um, 2021 the National Domestic Violence Hotline received more than 74,000 calls, chats, and texts um, on the on the line in the month of February. And that was the highest monthly contact volume in the 25-year history. Now, you know what was going on in 2021, right? We were still yeah, facing we were, COVID. We were still yeah, we facing still COVID. COVID. And... Um, we, I mean, we're still being challenged with that now, but think about when uh, COVID first started and so many states were in lockdown and we always wonder why or, or people wonder how men and women stay in these relationships and why they don't leave. Think about those people in lockdown and and those who couldn't leave, really couldn't leave these situations mm-hmm. because they were in lockdown. And this was a question that was asked to um, a, a doctor during that time. You know, like what role did the pandemic play um, in the rise of risk factors for domestic violence? And we know that the numbers increased significantly for not only men and women, but for children also. 
um, because we were in a global lockdown. Um, and, and we had to lock down to protect public health. Um, but did they ever look at the collateral damage that these lockdowns Tendedly impacted those who were dealing with domestic violence. The numbers, these are why the numbers of calls increased and the text increased and and the chat increased. People crying out for help because you can't go anywhere. And, And I'm one who works these chat lines. And you're on lockdown and you can't go anywhere. And before I continue with this, I want you to just talk about fatal misperceptions just a little bit. What's the synopsis for this book? Okay, with with, um, fatal misperceptions, I wanted wanted a different um, approach to than standing firm. So so this young lady, her name is Kelly, she was exposed to um, domestic violence early on in life. Her father killed her mother. And so her grandmother took her in and raised her in a sheltered home. So she never really got exposed to having relationships or anything like that because her her grandmother was protecting her. So after graduation, you know, they're out celebrating with her best friend, Stephanie, and they meet this guy, Brian, who uh, likes Kelly and and wants to date her. And Stephanie's telling her about all the red flags that start to pop up because the, the subtitles are red, red flags rise everywhere. And some of them are he, take, he takes her to the finest restaurants. Uh, he throws money at her, buys a whole new wardrobe, you know. Uh, what else? He, and he, uh, his, her grandmother ends up passing away. He pays for the funeral. So he's, like, throwing all this money at her. And then he, his temper flares up a couple of times. So these red flags are popping up. And she kind of notices them, but she, then she forgives him. And then, you know, her friend is in her ear all along telling her, hey, you know, this is this is not a good situation. The brother starts out happy with her, with them dating, but then he starts to question it too. And at that point, he disappears. And the last person to see the brother alive was the boyfriend, Brian. So the police end up arresting him and because this finally makes Kelly realize, you know, maybe I need to not be with this guy. So her savior comes in on, and, and Jamal, and he takes her, and he says he, he'll take care of her and all of this stuff, but she doesn't notice anything wrong going on with him. So that's where the story kind of twists. And, you know, I want the readers to be able to read that part and see what happens when she meets Jamal. But also I want to also point out that Kelly – the main character in this story is different from Rain because Kelly was exposed to domestic violence. She had these red flags, still, you know, noticed the red flags, but she kind of still forgave him and kept going, you know, through her situation, even though she noticed the red flags. So, and that can happen to, to people. Even though you see that this is wrong for you or could be wrong for you, you still go go forth with it because you like the person. So. That's a little bit about uh, fatal misperceptions. Okay, and that is another um, known um, domestic violence statistic that teens who witness domestic violence, um, as they get older, they do engage in risky behavior. Um, they have low self-esteem. Um, and I witnessed that, you know, firsthand. They tend to seek that attention and that, you know, love and um, the gifts that you mentioned and the, you know, from the other gentleman, uh, Brian was his name. Right. Right. They tend to seek uh, the gifts and the attention and um, and uh, I know something a little. You know, I, I, I got the twist, guys. I got the twist. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's definitely going to be a misperception, as the title does mention. Um, so 
he does do, and I've read several of Gerald's books, and they do kind of, um, they never disappoint. I will say that. They never disappoint. Um, and just with him giving me the synopsis and with the twist, I feel like you're definitely going to um, get what you are bargaining bargaining for. This book right now is um, listed as number one, correct? Correct. Has anything changed since this morning? No, it's still it's still the number one uh, new new book, and it was in the top ten for uh, for all books. Yeah, just released on the 4th, and it is uh, sitting at number one right now, guys. Um, so make sure that you go and check it out. Let them know where the book uh, can be purchased, Joe. Uh, right now it's available on Amazon. Uh, that's, the, that's the only place. It, when, it, when they come out like this, they come out at Amazon first, and then other booksellers end up picking them up. But because we're only, what, six days into this, seven days into this, it's, it's only available at Amazon right now. Okay. All right, just a few more statistics. Um, More than one in three women and one in four women have experienced either physical violence, rape, or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Why do you feel that um, men do not report domestic violence? Oh, this is, this is always one of my favorite questions because I, I get asked this question all the time. And you know, men, men, we are we are supposed to be the protectors, the providers, and you know, we have our male bravado, and we we uh, can end up in abusive situations. But most men are not going to get out there and tell that they were being abused by a woman. You know. It's that it's that that male bravado thing, you know. I'm not going to say this because other guys are going to see this and they're going to think less of me, and, and so that's why. I mean, it says one in seven, but it's probably a little bit different number than that because there's there's probably so many that go unreported because men are men, and they and we don't want to we don't want to say that, you know. We don't want to say somebody's abusing us because we're men. We're not supposed to be abused. Okay. And these are um, September. These are September first statistics. All right. Um, it is estimated that 13% of women and 6% of men will experience sexual co- coercion in their lifetime. Now, when I first got involved with with all of this, I want to say 13 years ago, we had subcategories, um, and you classified a man as a, a man, and I'm just going to leave it as that. A man is a man, all right? Now yeah. you have to look at it as my next statistic. One in four gay men and one in three bisexual men will be the victim of rape or physical abuse by an intimate partner in their lifetime. So now you have a whole different subcategory. So you worry about um, not only do um, – Men, our men, um, worry about I'm um, I'm the strong one. I'm am the protector. I am the provider. Um, I would not dare be caught going down and saying that my five foot two wife is being verbally, mentally, emotionally abusive to me. But now you also have the other, um, the men that are, you know, within the LGBTQIA um, categories as well. Now, I they will report faster than our straight men will. Um, and I don't, I don't understand. I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't. I just, for the life of me, I can't, I can't understand it. Wrong is wrong. Um, if you're mm-hmm. being abused in any type of way, um, men. And when I first started as an advocate, I would um, be on the side of the women more. 
because that's what you saw more and the children more. But someone has to be the voice for the men who are just, I, I'm embarrassed, you know? I'm six foot mm-hmm. two. She's five foot four. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But hell, I'm a I'm a I'm a pistol. I know how I am. You know what I'm saying? So right. I know there's women that are worse than me. You know what I'm saying? Because I because I wasn't raised that way, so I'm not gonna be up in a man you know what I'm saying, in a man's face. But I know that are there are women that are worse than me. So um you wouldn't dare think that that this is what's going on behind, you know, closed doors. And I get it, I understand, but um, wrong is wrong, and if you're embarrassed, there has to be someone that you can talk to, and so that's why there's we have these open um, means of communication, um, the chat line, um, the the text line, the hotline that you can call, um, physical buildings of advocacy that you can go in and speak to someone. Um, there's always, you know the police department where you can go and file that report. You know what I'm saying? Just like women, we want our women mm-hmm. to get out of these situations. Um, men, you know, we always want you to be out of these situations uh, as well. Um, mm-hmm. And then our children, it starts at an early age now when you have so many young adults in middle school, Gerald, in middle school, uh, mm-hmm. When you have children who are in these relationships, it starts with, you know, texting on the phone and these just dominating attitudes across um, cell phones nowadays and, and how you treat young ladies. And um, and, and then on into high school, you know, um, we, we may call it bullying now, but it it, it turns into sexual dominating relationships and then that goes on into college and then once they get to college you know um it's kind of like a trickle up effect so to speak um but it starts we see it now starting in in middle school you know and I know that you are the parent of a son do you monitor cell phone activity Oh yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm always on that stuff, <laughs> you know. And, yeah, but my my son's in high school now. He's like 17, so he's about to graduate. But yeah, I've always been over his stuff, you know, and and, and computers, laptops, everything. Um, I pay attention to it all. So, you know, I I'm that watchful parent. You know, I don't just leave him to his devices and stuff, and and that be it. And and you know, I have to I have to give his mother props because she. On the on the other end, when he's with her, she's doing the same thing. So, yeah, and you have to do that because, you know, like I said, I always refer back to the Standing Firm tour. We had an incident there too, that where it was um, I, I want to say it was early high school a couple, you know, and, and it was a video and things that you know, people you know had to have people go out there and talk to this young lady and get her out of this situation. And, you know, I remember. The mm-hmm. views that are on the video, you know, and, mm-hmm. and posting it, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, you can't, you can't have that, you know, you got to be watching your kids, you know, and I, I don't know where the parents were, I don't know what, what their response was when they saw this video, but, you know, if that would have been my daughter, oh man, <laughs> I don't know uh-huh. if I would have been around, <laughs> if that would have been my daughter, so I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> You know, if I'd had a daughter now, then no, no, we're not having that. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Do but, you uh, do have a about... few callers on the line? I do want to bring them in. Um, okay. We're speaking with our guest this evening here on Indie Fire, uh, author, uh, writer, producer, editor, musician, Gerald C. Anderson, Sr. Uh, we're talking about his latest release entitled Fatal Misperceptions. Um, and we're talking about domestic violence awareness as well. Area code 703. Who do we have on the line this evening? Right, they tend to get on the call and they tend to get a little scared. 
it's quite all right. We'll put you back in queue. If you decide that you want to say something a little later, we'll bring you back on, all right? Mm-hmm. No worries. All right, caller. Uh, area code 813. Who do we have on the line this evening? Yes, there is the key. <laughs> and I Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Who? All right. They don't want to talk either? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's all good. All right. <laughs> all right. We'll go for this one here. Let's try this. Last four digits of the number. All right. 9917. Because, see, maybe they think, well, you know, Maybe there's multiple people with that area code. So let's try this. Last four digits, 9917. And you're the only one with this. Who do we have on the line with Nakia and Gerald? My name is Angela. I'm dialing in to listening uh, to Mr. Gerald. Uh, very interested, in, interesting conversation. So I uh, just got on probably about 15 minutes, 10 minutes ago. And Miss Angela, where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Indian Head, Maryland. All right, all right. Well, thank you so much. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask our guest this evening? Uh, I don't have a question, but I, I thought it was very interesting to hear that, uh, you know, he covered the domestic violence for everyone, even men. Because um, uh, like you have, you have mentioned, a lot of men do not want to report it. So I thought that was very interested. And uh, are there communities or groups or, or, or uh, what I want to say, people out there that's working uh, with that, that community to help them to be comfortable in coming forward to ask uh, for help in domestic violence? Because you hear about a lot of groups uh, with women, but not so much for the men. Now, are you speaking in um, general for your area in particular or? Oh, just general, just general for, you know, just just in general. So I know in in my area, um, it's open to anyone. What I would recommend, the National Domestic Violence Hotline number, um, if, someone wanted to to simply text, they can text uh, 88788. They can call um, 800-799-7233. By calling or texting, you would just simply say, you know, hey, I'm going through um, uh, domestic violence. Where are you located at? I'm in Queens, New York. Are you requiring emergency services right now? No. Do you need somebody to talk to? Yes. So they're going to route you to um, somebody uh, locally that you can speak to. Do you want to come in and speak to somebody or over the phone? Over the phone is fine. All right? So you're talking if you if you called in. So you're speaking to somebody over the phone, and they will, uh, by the end of the conversation, you'll have – a location, if you need to be seen or would like to be seen, they'll have a location that you can go to. During that conversation, you will also be provided with information like, um, or you will be asked questions like, you know, um, and you'll, uh, because everything is kind of uh, confidential, you'll give out the information to whoever you're on the phone with. So they're not going to pick and, and pride and pull you know, confidential information from you. But throughout the conversation, you'll want to be able to release information like, I am a LGBTQIA um, female or male, or I've been, you know, a victim of domestic violence for the past year and my wife is beating me and I'm a female as well. You know what I'm saying? Throughout the conversation, the other individual on the line is able to, they've been trained to not trying to say this properly, to not 
impose on your confidential information, but to pull out and ask the right questions so that by the end of the call, they're able to direct you to where you need to go. So if you need to be seen at a physical building, you know, to come in and, and speak to somebody, then it will be one that is dedicated to only men or one that is for men and women or one that is for women and children. Okay, that's and very that's helpful, helpful. you know, because I was just saying they always you always hear information about women, so it's very, uh, very good information to know that they do have um, help line for males as well. Yes. And I just want to add that there are for men. I'm sorry, what was but that? I, I want to make it seem like the hotline is for men. No, this hotline is for um, for everybody, but this, because this is the, the national domestic violence hotline. Um, English, Spanish, um, there's 200 plus uh, interpretation services on this line. So if you call and you say, you know, um, I need uh, this line in the Philippines or I need a Filipino interpreter, then you're able to get the okay. Filipino interpreter. Um, so, but that is again, oh. 800-799-7233. Or if you don't feel confident talking to somebody, you can text um, that oh. line at 88788. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you again for calling in, Angela. I'm going to put you back in queue and get over to our next caller, all right? All right, thank you. Four of your number is 4498. All right, who do we have on the line with Nakia and Gerald? I don't know, but they're jamming, that's for sure. They are jamming. <laughs> <laughs> I will put you back in queue. <laughs> Thank you so much for calling. <laughs> you all continue to listen in. <laughs> so, Gerald, what's next? What's next for you? I know you said you had about um, 10 more books, you know, sitting on the computer. What's next for you? Well, I, um, I, I've kind of stopped writing to basically promote this tour and awareness uh, all behind big misperceptions. So uh, they're not, there's not going to be another book coming out from me until next next year sometime. I don't know which one that's going to be right now, but you know, one of the ones that's probably already done will come out. But um, right now, it's just about, the main focus is just about bringing awareness to the domestic violence and promoting this book as part of that. And I also want to say any purchases of fatal misperceptions made during the month of October of this year, will 50% of that, uh, of that will go to um, domestic violence organizations. I haven't decided which one. I know the national is going to get some, and then Maryland is going to get some. So uh, 50% of everything that's that's made from fatal misperceptions this month will go toward the making uh, bringing awareness. And then, then after this, 10% of everything will go to domestic violence awareness. Awesome. And remember, remember guys, um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but we should be aware um, and correcting the issue every single day of the year. Just because we acknowledge it, we do more, we promote more, we're out there making changes, you know, uh, in this month, uh, it should be a cause that we are uh, fighting to effectively change every single day of the year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So as we stated, uh, all purchases uh, for fatal misperceptions in the month of October, 50% of those purchases will go towards domestic violence organizations. And thereafter, October, 10% will go towards domestic violence organizations. Mm-hmm. I love it. Let me give that number out again. You missed it. you missed a, a number. I'm sorry. One eight hundred seven nine nine seven two three three. And again, that SMS text 
Mask um, number is 888-7888. Then the website, um, the hotline.org um, is one website. Um, you can also search shelters, um, and it really would depend on where you're located um, to search shelters. Um, but nccadv.org. Um, again, the website is 24 hours. Um, but your best your best bet to text. Again, uh, that text line is going to be eight eight seven eight eight. Jared, I want to go ahead and give you the opportunity now to go ahead and get all of your contact information out. For those who may be listening live, for those who may come back and listen to one of the many, many playback shows, if they're interested in purchasing books, if they're interested in getting you on their show for interviews, if they're interested in getting you in for book signings, um, if they're interested in having you in their church to play a little music, uh, editing magazines, Gerald does it all, guys. Uh, whatever the need may be for them to get in contact with you, the floor is now yours to get. And it's easy. It's easy, guys, to remember this, but. The floor is now yours to get all of your contact information out to them. Okay. So since the last uh, show, you know, I've simplified my contact information. I put it all on one site. It's called Linktree. So you can you can reach me at Linktree, and then that's slash Cheryl C. Anderson Sr., S-R. And Linktree is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E. So l i n k t r dot e e slash daryl c anderson s r and you'll have all of my contact and some information all of my social media everything very simple very simple all right yeah. guys that is it that is it Gerald. i want to thank you so much for being back here with me on indie fire you know your family you're welcome back here <laughs> at any time i'm so 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 thankful that you thought enough of us to come back and share this new um, book, Fatal Misperceptions, with us. Give us a moment of your time to talk about um, your thoughts on domestic violence. Share this new campaign with us. Um, guys, again, Fatal Misperceptions available on Amazon. 50% of purchases this month will go towards domestic violence um, organizations. 10% thereafter will go towards um, domestic violence organizations as well. All right? So make sure that you go ahead and purchase that book. Um, available again on Amazon. Make sure that you're back here with us on Thursday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with blues singer, songwriter, rapper, and producer, Black Coffee. And, guys, guess what? Nakia is in the running for Fab Over 40. Yes, I had no idea I had even been nominated um, until earlier today. Um, so I have the opportunity to win $40,000 in cash um, at two spreads, uh, article cover, yeah, and a spotcation. So if you would head over to uh, votefab.com, Nope, votefab40.com forward slash 2020 forward slash Nakia hyphen Qualis and cast your vote, all right? You can vote every day until October 31st for your girl, all right? And maybe we'll get that money together, all right? Until Thursday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You guys have an amazing night. Thank you again, Zero. Daily inspiration for everyone, for everyone. Entertainment news and daily inspiration for everyone, for everyone. Entertainment news and daily inspiration for everyone, for everyone. Entertainment news and daily inspiration for everyone, for everyone, yeah.